Chapter 16, The Haircut It had been almost a year since Bruno had come home to find Maria packing his things, and his memories of life in Berlin had almost faded all away. When he thought back, he could remember that Carl and Martin were two of his three best friends for life, but try as he might, he couldn't remember who the other one was. And then something happened that meant for two days he could leave out with and return to his old house. Grandmother had died, and the family had to go home for the funeral. While he was there, Bruno realized he wasn't quite as small as he had been when he left, because he could see over things that he couldn't see over before, and when they stayed in their old house, he could look through the window on the top floor and see across Berlin without having to stand on tiptoes. Bruno hadn't seen his grandmother since leaving Berlin, but he had thought about her every day. The things he remembered most about her were the productions that she and he and Gretel performed at Christmas and birthdays, and how she always had the perfect costume to suit whatever role he played. When he thought that they would never be able to do that again, it made him very sad indeed. The two days they spent in Berlin were also very sad ones. There was the funeral, and Bruno and Gretel and father and mother and grandfather sat in the front row, father wearing his most impressive uniform, the starched impressed one with the decorations. Father was particularly sad, mother told Bruno, because he had fought with grandmother and they hadn't made up before she died. There were a lot of wreaths delivered to the church, and Father was proud of the fact that one of them had been sent by the Fury. But when Mother heard that, she said Grandmother would turn in her grave if she knew it was there. Bruno felt almost glad when they returned to Outwith. The house there had become his home now, and he'd stopped worrying about the fact that it had only three fours rather than five, and that it didn't bother him so much that the soldiers came and went as if they owned the place. It slowly dawned on him that things weren't too bad there after all, especially since he'd met Schmal. He knew that there were many things he should be happy about, like the fact that father and mother seemed cheerful all the time now, and mother didn't have to take as many of her afternoon naps or medicinal sherries. And Gretel was going through a phase, mother's words, and tended to keep out of his way. There was also the fact that Lieutenant Cotler had been transferred away with, from Outwith and wasn't around to make Bruno feel angry and upset all the time. His departure had come about very suddenly, and there had been a lot of shouting between mother and father about it late at night, but when he was gone, that was for sure and he wasn't coming back. Gretel was inconsolable. That was something else to be happy about. No one called him little man anymore. But the best thing was that he had a friend called Schmal. He enjoyed walking along the fence every afternoon, and was pleased to see his friend seemed a lot happier these days, and his eyes didn't seem so sunken, although his body was still ridiculously skinny and his face unpleasantly gray. One day, while sitting opposite him at their usual place, Bruno remarked, "'This is the strangest friendship I've ever had.' Why? asked Schmal. Because every other boy I've ever been friends with has been someone that I've been able to play with, he replied. We never get to play uh, together. All we do is sit here and talk. I like sitting here and talking, said Schmal. Well, I do too, of course, said Bruno, but it's a pity we can't do something more exciting from time to time. A bit of exploring, perhaps, or a game of football. We've never even seen each other without all this wiring fencing in the way. Bruno often made comments like this because he wanted to pretend that the incident a few months earlier, when he had denied his friendship with Small, had never taken place. It still pl- preyed on his mind and made him feel bad about himself, although Schmal, to his credit, seemed to have forgotten all about it. Maybe someday we will, said Schmal, if they ever let us out. Bruno decided to th- or started to think more and more about the two sides of the fence and the reason it was there in the first place. He considered speaking to father or mother about it, but suspected that they would either be angry with him with- for mentioning it or tell him something unpleasant about Schmal and his family. So instead, he did something quite unusual. He decided to talk to the hopeless case. Gretel's room had changed quite considerably since the last time he had been there. For one thing, there wasn't a single doll in sight. One afternoon, a month or so earlier, around the time that Lieutenant Cotler had left out with, Gretel had decided that she didn't like dolls anymore, and had put them all into four large bags and thrown them away. In their place, she had hung up maps of Europe that Father had given her, and every day she put little pins into them and moved the pins around constantly after consulting the daily newspaper. Bruno thought she might be going mad, but still, she didn't tease him or bully him as much as she used to, so he thought there could be no harm in talking to her. Hello, he said, knocking politely on her door, because he knew how angry she always got if he just went in. What do you want? asked Gretel, who was sitting at her dressing table, experimenting with her hair. Nothing, said Bruno. Then go away. Bruno nodded, but came inside anyway, and sat down on the side of the bed. Gretel watched him from out of the side of her eyes, but didn't say anything. Gretel, he said finally, can I ask you something? If you make it quick, she said. Everything here at Outwith, he began, but she interrupted him immediately. It's not called Outwith, Bruno, she said angrily, as if this was the worst mistake anyone 
had ever made in the history of the world. Why can't you pronounce it right? It is called Outwith, he protested. It's not, she insisted, pronouncing the name of the camp correctly for him. Bruno frowned and shrugged his shoulders at the same time. But that's what I said, he said. No, it's not. Anyway, I'm not going to argue with you, said Gretel, losing her patience already, for she had very little of it to begin with. What is it anyway? What do you want to know? I want to know about the fence, he said firmly, deciding this was the most important thing to begin with. I want to know why it's there. Gretel turned round in her chair and looked at him curiously. You mean you don't know, she asked. No, said Bruno. I don't understand why we're not allowed on the other side of it. What's wrong with us that we can't go over there and play? Gretel stared at him and then suddenly started laughing, only stopping when she saw that Bruno was being perfectly serious. Bruno, she said in a child voice, as if this was the most obvious thing in the world. The fence isn't to stop us from going over there. It's to stop them from coming over here. Bruno considered this, but it didn't make it any clearer. But why, he asked. Because they have to be kept together, explained Gretel. With their families, you mean? Well, yes, with their families, but with their own kind, too. What do you mean, their own kind? Gretel sighed and shook her head. With the other Jews, Bruno. Didn't you know that? That's why they have to be kept together. They can't mix with us. Jews, said Bruno, testing the word out. He quite liked the way it sounded. Jews, he repeated. All the people over on that side of the fence are Jews. Yes, that's right, said Gretel. Are we Jews? Gretel opened her mouth wide, as if she had been slapped in the face. No, Bruno, she said. No, we most certainly are not, and you shouldn't even say something like that. But why not? What are we, then? We're, began Gretel, but then she had to stop to think about it. We're, she repeated, but this wasn't, she wasn't quite sure what the answer to this question really was. Well, we're not Jews, she said finally. I know we're not, said Bruno in frustration. I'm asking you, if we're not Jews, what are we instead? We're the opposite, said Gretel, answering quickly and sounding a lot more satisfied with this answer. Yes, that's it. We're the opposite. All right, said Bruno, pleased that he had it settled in his head at last. And the opposite live on this side of the fence, and the Jews live on that. That's right, Bruno. Don't the Jews like the opposite, then? No, it's us who don't like them, stupid. Bruno frowned. Gretel had been told time and time again that she wasn't allowed to call him stupid, but still she persisted with it. Well, why don't we like them? he asked. "'Because they're Jews,' said Gretel. "'I see. And the opposite and the Jews don't get along.' "'No, Bruno,' said Gretel. But she said this slowly, because she had discovered something unusual in her hair and was examining it carefully. "'Well, can't someone just get them together and—' Bruno was interrupted by the sound of Gretel breaking into a piercing scream, one that woke Mother up from her afternoon nap and brought her running into the bedroom to find out which one of her children had murdered the other one. While experimenting with her hair, Gretel had found a tiny egg, no bigger than the top of a pin. She showed it to Mother, who looked through her hair, pulling strands of it apart quickly, before marching over to Bruno and doing the same thing to him. "'Oh, I don't believe it,' said Mother angrily. "'I knew something like this would happen in a place like this.' It turned out that both Gretel and Bruno had lice in their hair, and Gretel had to be treated with a special shampoo that smelled horrible, and afterwards she sat in her room for hours on end, crying her eyes out. Bruno had the shampoo as well, but then Father decided the best thing for him was to start afresh, and he got a razor and shaved all Bruno's hair off, which made Bruno cry. It didn't take long, and he hated seeing all of his hair float down from his head and land on the floor at his feet, but Father said it had to be done. Afterwards, Bruno looked at himself in the bathroom mirror and felt sick. His entire head looked misshapen now that he was bald, and his eyes looked too big for his face. He was almost scared of his own reflection. Don't worry, Father assured him. It'll grow back. It'll only take a few weeks. It's the filth around here that did it, said Mother. If some people could only see the effect this place is having on us all. When he saw himself in the mirror, Bruno couldn't help but think how much he looked like Schmal now, and he wondered whether all the people on that side of the fence had lice as well, and that's why their heads were shaved too. When he saw his friend the next day, Schmal started to laugh at Bruno's appearance, which didn't do a lot for his dwindling self-confidence. I look just like you now, said Bruno sadly, as if this was a terrible thing to admit. Only fatter, added, admitted Schmal. Chapter 17, Mother Gets Her Own Way Over the course of the next several weeks, Mother seemed increasingly unhappy with life at Outwith, and Bruno understood perfectly well why that might be. After all, when they'd first arrived, he had hated it, due to the fact that it was nothing like home and lacked such things as three best friends for life. But that had changed for him over time, mostly due to Schmal, who had become more important to him than Carl or Daniel or Martin ever had been. But M Mother didn't have a Schmal of her own. There was no one for her to talk to, and the only person who had, she had been remotely friendly with, the young Lieutenant Kotler, had been transferred somewhere else. Although he tried not to be one of those boys who spent his time listening to, at keyholes and down chimneys, B 
Birna was passing by father's office one afternoon while mother and father were inside having one of their conversations to eavesdrop, but they were talking quite loudly and he couldn't help but overhear. It's horrible, mother was saying. Just horrible. I can't stand it anymore. We don't have any choice, said father. This is our assignment and... No, this is your assignment, said Mother. Your assignment, not ours. You stay if you want to. And what will people think, asked Father, if I permit you and the children to return to Berlin without me? They will ask questions about my commitment to the work here. Work, shouted Mother. You call this work. Bruno didn't hear much more because the voices were getting closer to the door, and there was always a chance that Mother would come storming out in in search of a medicinal sherry. So he ran back upstairs instead. Still, he had heard enough to know that there was a chance they might be returning to Berlin, and to his surprise, he didn't know how to feel about that. There was one part of him that remembered he had loved his life back there, but so many things would have changed by now. Carl and the other two best friends whose name he couldn't remember would have probably forgotten about him by now. Grandmother was dead, and they almost never heard from Grandfather, who Father had said had gone senile. But on the other hand, he'd grown used to life at out with. He didn't mind here least. He'd become much friendlier with Maria than he ever had been back in Berlin. Gretel was still going through a phase and keeping out of his way, and she didn't seem to be quite, quite so much of a hopeless case anymore. And his afternoon conversations with Schmal filled him with happiness. Bruno didn't know how to feel, and decided whatever happened, he would accept the decision without complaint. Nothing at all changed for a few weeks. Life went on as normal. Father spent most of his time either in his office or on the other side of the fence. Mother kept very quiet during the day and was having an awful lot more of her afternoon naps, some of them not even in the afternoon but before lunch, and Bruno was worried for her health because he'd never known anyone to need quite so many medicinal sherries. Gretel stayed in her room concentrating on the various maps she had pasted on the walls and consulting the newspapers for hours at a time before moving the pins around a little. Harleys was particularly pleased with her for doing this. And Bruno did exactly what was asked of him and caused no chaos at all and enjoyed the fact that he had one secret friend whom no one knew about. Then one day, Father summoned Bruno and Gretel. He didn't meet into his office and informed them of the changes that were to come. Sit down, children, he said, indicating the two large leather armchairs that were usually told not to sit in when they had occasion to visit Father's office because of their grubby mitts. Father sat down beside, behind his desk. We've decided to make a few changes, he continued, looking a little sad as he spoke. Tell me this, are you happy here? Yes, father, of course, said Gretel. Certainly, father, said Bruno. And you don't miss Berlin at all? The children paused for a moment and glanced at each other, wondering which of one of them was going to commit to an answer. Well, I miss it terribly, terribly, said Gretel eventually. I wouldn't mind having some friends again. Bruno smiled, thinking about his secret. Friends, said father, nodding his head. Yes, I've often thought of that. It must have been lonely for you at times. Very lonely, said Gretel in a determined voice. And you, Bruno, asked Father, looking at him now, do you miss your friends? Well, yes, he replied, considering his answer carefully. But I think I'd miss people no matter where I went. That was an indirect reference to Schmal, but he didn't want to make it any more explicit than that. But would you like to go back to Berlin, asked Father, if the chance was there? All of us, asked Bruno. Father gave a deep sigh and shook his head. Mother and Gretel and you, back to our old house in Berlin. Would you like that? Bruno thought about it. Well, I wouldn't like it if you weren't there, he said, because that was the truth. So you'd prefer to stay here with me? I'd prefer all four of us to stay together, he said, reluctantly including Gretel in that, whether that was in Berlin or out with. Oh, Bruno, said Gretel in an exasperated voice, and he didn't know whether that was because he might be spoiling the plans for their return or because, according to her, he continued to mispronounce the name of their home. Well, for the moment, I'm afraid that's not impossible, said Father. I'm afraid that the Fury will not relieve me of my command just yet. Mother, on the other hand, thinks it would be a good time for the three of you to return home and reopen the house. And when I think about it, he paused for a moment and looked out of the window to his left, the window that led off to a view of the camp on the other side of the fence. When I think about it, perhaps she is right. Perhaps this is not a place for children. There are hundreds of children here, said Bruno, without really thinking about his words before saying them only they're on the other side of the fence. A silence followed this remark, but it wasn't like a normal silence where it just happens to be that no one is talking. It was like a silence that was very noisy. Father and Gretel stared at him, and he blinked in surprise. What do you mean there are hundreds of children over there, asked Father. What do you know about what goes on over there? Bruno opened his mouth to speak, but worried that he would get himself into trouble if he revealed too much. I can see them from my bedroom window, he said finally. They're very far away, of course, but it looks like there are hundreds, all wearing the striped pajamas. The striped pajamas said, yes, said Father, nodding his head, and you've been watching, have you? 
Well, I've seen them, said Bruno. I'm not sure if that's the same thing. Father smiled. Very good, Bruno, he said. And you're right, it's not quite the same thing. He hesitated again and then nodded his head as if he had made a final decision. No, she's right, he said, speaking out loud but not looking at either Gretel or Bruno. She's absolutely right. You've been here long enough as it is. It's time for you to go home. And so the decision was made. Word was sent ahead that the house should be cleaned, the windows washed, the banister varnished, the linen pressed, the beds made, and Father announced that Mother, Gretel, and Bruno would be returning to Berlin within the week. Bruno found that he was not looking forward to this as much as he would have expected, and he was dreading to having to tell Schmal the news. Chapter 18, Thinking Up the Final Adventure The day after Father told Bruno that he would be returning to Berlin soon, Schmal didn't arrive at the fence as usual, nor did he show up the day after that. On the third day, when Bruno arrived, there was no one sitting cross-legged on the ground, and he waited for ten minutes and was about to turn back for home, extremely worried that he would have to leave out with without seeing his friend again, when a dot in the distance became a speck, and that became a blob, and that became a figure, and that in turn became the boy in the striped pajamas. Bruno broke into a smile when he saw the figure coming towards him, and he sat down on the ground, taking the piece of bread and the apple he had smuggled with him out of his pocket to give to Schmal. But even from a distance, he could see that his friend looked even more unhappy than usual, and when he got to the fence, he didn't reach for the food with his usual eagerness. "'I thought you weren't coming anymore,' said Bruno. "'I came yesterday and the day before that, and you weren't here.' "'I'm sorry,' said Schmal. "'Something happened.' Bruno looked at him and narrowed his eyes, trying to guess what it might be. He wondered whether Schmal had been told that he was going home, too. After all, coincidences like that do happen, such as the fact that Bruno and Schmal shared the same birthday. "'Well,' he asked Bruno, "'what it was it?' Papa, said Schmal, we can't find him. Can't find him? That's very odd. You mean he's lost? I suppose so, said Schmal. He was here on Monday, and then he went on work duty with some other men, and none of them have come back. And he hasn't written you a letter, asked Bruno, or left a note to say when he'll be coming back? No, said Schmal. How odd, said Bruno. Have you looked for him? he asked after a moment. Of course I have, said Schmal with a sigh. I did what you're always talking about. I did some exploration. And there was no sign. None. Well, that's very strange, said Bruno, but I think there must be a simple explanation. And what's that? asked Schmal. I imagine the men were taken to work in another town, and they have to stay there for a few days until the work is done. And the post isn't very good here anyway. I expect he'll turn up one day soon. I hope so, said Schmal, who looked as if he was about to cry. I don't know what we're supposed to do without him. I could ask father if you wanted, said Bruno cautiously, hoping that Schmal wouldn't say yes. I don't think that would be a good idea, said Schmal, which, to Bruno's disappointment, was not a flat-out rejection of the offer. Why not, he asked. Father is very knowledgeable about life on that side of the fence. I don't think the soldiers like us, said Schmal. Well, he added with something as close to a laugh as he could muster, I know they don't like us. They hate us. Bruno sat back in surprise. I'm sure they don't hate you, he said. They do, said Schmal, leaning forward, his eyes narrowing and his lips curling up a little in anger. But that's all right, because I hate them, too. I hate them, he repeated forcefully. You don't hate father, do you? asked Bruno. Schmal bit his lip and said nothing. He had seen Bruno's father on any number of occasions and couldn't understand how such a man could have a son who was so friendly and kind. Anyway, said Bruno, after a suitable pause, not wishing to discuss the topic any further, I have something to tell you, too. You do? asked Schmal, looking up hopefully. Yes, I'm going back to Berlin. Schmal's mouth dropped open in surprise. When, he asked, his voice catching slightly in his throat as he did so. Well, this is Thursday, said Bruno, and we're leaving on Saturday after lunch. But for how long? asked Schmal. I think it's forever, said Bruno. Mother doesn't like it at Outwith. She says it's no place to bring up two children. So father is staying here to work because the Fury has big things in mind for him, but the rest of us are going home. He said the word home, despite the fact that he wasn't sure where home was anymore. So I won't see you again, asked Schmal. Well, someday, yes, said Bruno. You could come on a holiday in Berlin. You can't stay here forever, after all, can you? Schmal shook his head. I suppose not, he said sadly. I won't have anyone to talk to anymore when you're gone, he added. No, said Bruno. He wanted to add the words, I'll miss you too, Schmal, to the sentence, but found that he was a little embarrassed to say them. So tomorrow will be the last time we see each other until then, he continued. We'll have to say our goodbyes then. I'll try to bring you an extra special treat. Schmal nodded, but couldn't find any words to express his sorrow. I wish we got to play together, said Bruno after a long pause. Just once, just to remember. So do I, said Schmal. We've been talking to each other for more than a year, and we never got to play once. And do you want to know what else, he added? 
All this time, I've been watching where you live from out of my bedroom window, and I've never even seen it for myself what it's like. You wouldn't like it, said Schmal. Yours is much nicer, he added. I'd still like to have seen it, said Bruno. Schmal thought it for a few moments, and then reached down and put his hand under the fence and lifted it a little, to the height where a small boy, perhaps the size and shape of Bruno, could fit underneath. Well, said Schmal, why don't you then? Bruno blinked and thought about it. I don't think I'd be allowed, he said doubtfully. Well, you're probably not allowed to come here and talk to me every day either, said Schmal, but you still do it, don't you? But if I was caught, I'd be in trouble, said Bruno, who was sure mother and father would not approve. That's true, said Schmal, lowering the fence again and looking at the ground with tears in his eyes. I suppose I'll see you tomorrow to say goodbye then. Neither boy did anything for a moment. Suddenly, Bruno had a brainwave. Unless, he began, thinking about it for a moment and allowing a plan to hatch in his head. He reached a hand up to his head and felt where his hair used to be, but was just now stubble that hadn't fully grown back. Don't you remember you said I looked like you, he said, he asked Schmal, since I had my head shaved. Only fatter, conceded Schmal. Well, if that's the case, said Bruno, and if I had a pair of striped pajamas too, then I could come over on a visit and no one would be any the wiser. Schmal's face brightened up and he broke into a wide smile. Do you think so, he asked. Would you do it? Of course, said Bruno. It would be a great adventure, our final adventure. I could do some exploring at last. And you could help me look for Papa, said Schmal. Why not, said Bruno. We'll take a walk around and see whether we can find any evidence. That's always wise when you're exploring. The only problem is getting a spare pair of striped pajamas. Schmal shook his head. That's all right, he said. There's a hut where they keep them. I can get some in my size and bring them with me. Then you can change and we can look for Papa. Wonderful, said Bruno, caught up in the enthusiasm of the moment. Then it's a plan. We'll meet at the same time tomorrow, said Schmal. Don't be late this time, said Bruno, standing up and dusting himself down. And don't forget the striped pajamas. Both boys went home in high spirits that afternoon. Bruno imagined a great adventure ahead and finally an opportunity to see what was really on the other side of the fence before he went back to Berlin, not to mention getting in a little serious exploration as well. And Schmal saw a chance to get someone to help him in the search of his papa. All in all, it seemed like a very sensible plan and a good way to say goodbye.